Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday morning worship services here at Cedar Grove. It's good to see each and every one of you here this morning. And it's great to be here in the house of the Lord with all of our brothers and sisters. I would also like to say a special thank you to all those who are watching via Facebook Live this morning at home. I have several announcements to pass along, but before we get started, our, our order of worship this morning, our song leader will be Monty Russell, and our first song will be number 272, 272. Our opening prayer this morning will be by Mac Bracewell, closing prayer by Harry Smith, scripture reading by Kenny Skipper, and at the appropriate time, Brother Randall McCarter will prepare our minds for the partaking of the Lord's Supper. On our sick list this morning, baby Jack Rigdon remains in a neonatal intensive care unit at Sacred Heart Hospital in Pensacola, and he is slowly making some progress, but still has a way to go before he is able to be released. Please continue to pray for him. Jimmy Cobb will be having a cochlear hearing implant tomorrow in Mobile. Please add him to your prayer list at this time. Billy Max and Mary Wilson were both admitted to the Sandy Ridge Nursing Home. This is in Milton, Florida. That was on Friday. Mary is not doing well at this time. The address is on the bulletin board in the foyer if anyone would like to uh, take note of that and send them anything. Brett Bozeman and Christel Prestwood both continue to recover from their surgeries. Uh, Brother Brett's here with us this morning. Uh, glad to see him. Sarah Noakes, this is the mother of Sister Niva Harrison, had hip replacement surgery on Thursday in Tennessee. The surgery went very well and she is doing good. Please remember those who are battling cancer. Those include Juanette Mullen, Shirley Graham, the sister of Sharon Dye, Patsy Green, Joe Cantor, and Susan Johns. Also remember those in the nursing home, which includes Charlotte Bryant, Jimmy Lindsay, Christine Bundrick, and Audrey Wilson. Congratulations to Brody Bryan, who was baptized last Sunday afternoon by Wes Thomason. We pray that Brody will have a long and useful service in the Lord's Church. Also, please pray for Susan Sowell, who came forward on Sunday night requesting prayers of the congregation. Susan, we love you, and we appreciate you very much. The weekly ladies' Bible class will meet Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. in the church library. The monthly ladies' Bible class will meet tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Autumn Bailey will be presenting the lesson. It will be Bring a Friend Night, and we encourage all those to attend. That's tomorrow night, 6 o'clock, here at the church, ladies' Bible class. The Evergreen Congregation will be hosting a gospel singing today from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock. Everyone is invited to come. There are sign-up sheets for adult Lads to Leaders activities. Uh, these are now on the back table in the foyer. Brother Trent will explain all nine events that adults can partake in in his upcoming bulletins. Today he explains Read the Word. Sign-up sheets will be out until all events have been explained by Trent. We highly encourage all adults to participate. We'd love for our youth to see us all being actively involved. Again, that's Lads to Leaders activities for our adults here at the church. All youth are invited to go to Camp Wiregrass's Youth Connection. That's this afternoon. Brother Trent and Thomas will be going. The church van will leave at 2 o'clock. Please let Brother Trent know if you plan to attend. We would also like to say... Good job and congratulations to Brother Tim Dillard, who turned in seven gallon bags of tabs to the Ronald McDonald House. We love you, Tim, and we're very proud of you. Don't forget our evening services today at 5 o'clock p.m. Uh, we will have multiple men who will be leading the services this evening. Are there any more announcements to pass along before we get started? If not, please open your hymnals to 272 and join in our singing with Brother Monty Russell. Thank you. We'll sing the first and third verses. First and third. 272. At the road.
54. Number 54. First, second, and fourth. First, second, and fourth. Number 54. First, second, and fourth. <coughs>
Lord's Day, for this blessing and opportunity that we have to assemble together and worship you. We pray, Father, that our worship will be in spirit and truth and be pleasing to you. Thank you, Father, for being with us, for blessing us, for loving us. Thank you for the gift of your Son, and our Savior, Jesus Christ, for all the blessings that we enjoy in Christ. Thank you for that gift. Christ was willing to go to that cross and pay the price for us that we couldn't pay. Shed his innocent blood that we might have forgiveness of sin and hope for eternal life. Father, we're thankful that you love us and bless us like you do. Father, we're mindful of many of our church family and our extended families and friends, and many have asked us to remember them in our prayers. We have many that are sick. We pray for each one. We're thankful, Father, you hear our prayers, and you know our needs before we even ask, and you know what's best. And, Father, we pray that your will be done. Thank you that we can lift up each one to you in prayer and ask you to be with them and bless them, bless their families and those that are caring for them, their doctors and nurses, that all the things that are done will be done right and help them to regain their health. And, Father, we are mindful that many are improving and getting good reports and doing much better, and we're thankful for that. Thank you for that blessing. And, Father, we have several, have many that are in nursing homes, and we pray for each one of them. We pray for those that are shut in at their own homes and not able to be out, that would love to be with us in our worship this morning. We pray that you'll bless each one with the things that they need. Father, we pray for those families that's lost loved ones. We pray that you, your peace and comfort will be with them. Help us to look to you for, for guidance. For Father, give us wisdom and understanding. Help us to live as you would have us to, and that we might be pleasing to you and live in a way that would bring honor and glory to you. We pray for our country. We pray for its leaders. We pray that they'll look to you for guidance. Father, we're thankful for our leadership here at Cedar Grove, and we pray for our elders. Pray that you'll bless them with wisdom and guidance as they oversee the church here. Father, we realize we're weak and sinful and fall short many times. We ask you to forgive us of those things as we repent of them. Help us, Father, to see opportunities to do good. Help us to live as you would have us to. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. To better prepare our minds for the taking of the Lord's Supper, let's sing number 371. 371. First and third verses. 371.
As we come to this part of our worship, the elders has decided that this is our time to partake of the Lord's Supper. Is there anyone who needs the communion pack? I don't see anybody. I'd like to go back to the Old Testament, to the book of Isaiah chapter 53 and read some scriptures there that Isaiah wrote to us. We're going to start reading with verse 5. Isaiah 53 and verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our, our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from the prison and from judgment. And who would declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Those were prophecies of, that Isaiah made concerning Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verses 26 and 28 says, As far as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. In verse 27, Therefore whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of Christ. In Hebrews 9 and verse 28, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Let us give thanks for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we have that we can participate in this Lord's Supper in a remembrance of Christ and the death that he gave upon the cross of Calvary. We pray, Father, that each one of us might examine ourselves and we might partake of this bread in a manner that would be acceptable before you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. After Christ had given the bread to the disciples, he then took the cup and gave that to them and told them to partake of that. Let us give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Our Heavenly Father, we again thank you for this fruit of the vine, an emblem that represents the blood that Christ shed upon the cross of Calvary, that we might have the remissions of our sins and eternal life. We pray again, Father, that we will partake of this in a manner that would be acceptable in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And as that concludes the Lord's Supper, we are also 
told to lay, my, lay by and store upon the first day of each week as each one of us has been prospered. But let us pray. Our Father, we come before you again thanking you for this day. There's opportunity that we have that we can assemble and worship you, partake of the Lord's Supper. We thank you, Father, for all the material possessions that we have, the blessings that you give us every day. We pray, Father, that you'll continue to look at each one of our situations and bless us as you see we have need. And we pray, Father, that we will be able to give back to you a part of that in a way that would be acceptable. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you will, Mark number 886 is a song of invitation. Number 886. We'll sing that after Tent, after Brother Trent comes and speaks to us. And then, if you will, turn to number 417. We'll sing this before he speaks. Number 417, all who'd like, please stand. We'll sing the first and third verses. First and third, 417. morning's lesson will be taken from the New Testament book of Romans. That'll be the book of Romans, uh, chapter 12, verse 12. Romans 12, chapter 12, verse 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in pr to prayer. In prayer, I'm sorry. Good morning, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here today as we worship God in spirit and in truth with our brothers and sisters in Christ. If you have your hymnals, please turn to number 592. Take the name of Jesus with you. We'll sing all four verses before we dive into our lesson this morning. 592.
Are there any books that you remember fondly growing up as a child reading? Maybe your mom had a favorite book she would like to read you before bed. Or maybe there was a book or a series of books that you would read at schools that you enjoyed. That if you saw it today, it would spark a memory. For me, this is one of those books. Amelia Bedelia. I read these books growing up, and I loved them. If you don't know the premise of the book, it is about a young lady who is a maid to a Mrs. Roberts, a very wealthy woman. And she, unfortunately, has a lot of miscommunication. I won't read the entirety of the book. But I'd like to read a a small portion of it. There was a list, and she found the list of things that she was to do. Now, she was at the house alone. She looks at her list, dusts the furniture. Did you ever hear tell of such a silly thing? At my house, we undust the furniture, but to each his own way. Amelia Bedelia took one last look at the bathroom. She saw a big box with the words dusting powder on it. Well, look at that. A special powder to dust with, exclaimed Amelia Bedelia. So Amelia Bedelia dusted the furniture that should be dusty enough. My, how nice it smells. Draw the drapes when the sun comes in, read Amelia Bedelia. She looked up. The sun was coming in. Amelia Bedelia looked at the list again. Draw the drapes? That's what it says. I'm not much of a hand at drawing, but I'll try. So Amelia Bedelia sat right down, and she drew on a piece of paper those drapes. Of course, poor Amelia Bedelia, she did not understand the list. Even though Mrs. Roberts, her boss, had written a list, there was not effective communication. This morning, we will discuss how to discuss Christianity effectively. All of us, if not most of us, would consider ourselves to be Christians. That's who we are. That's a part of us. It's in our fiber. It's in our being. It's found at the depths of our spirit and at the bottom of our soul. Therefore, we should discuss it with other people. Now, frankly, a lot of times we find ourselves only talking to other people about things that we like or enjoy, whether it be sports, whether it be different hobbies, fishing, guns, politics. It's stuff that we discuss that we are comfortable with. Well, here is the thing. A lot of times we don't discuss our Christianity. We don't discuss our faith because we don't have any practice. We don't discuss our faith because we might be scared. We might feel or we are worried about the unknown. Yes, there might be times where it is awkward and we are uncomfortable. But just like anything else, if we practice, if we study how to do so, how to discuss our faith with others, it will get easier. And here's the thing, church. We are instructed by Jesus Christ to to do so, to spread the gospel. This is not a religion of isolationism. This is a religion of having our light and sharing that light with the world. Sharing it with our neighbor. Sharing it with our friends. Sharing it with our coworkers. Sharing it with our neighbors. And let me ask you a tough question. When was the last time that you talked about your faith? The last time that you talked about Jesus with somebody else? If you can't remember, well then that's a problem. This morning, we are going to look 
at 10 tips on how to discuss Christianity effectively. Because here's the thing. Nobody wants you to go out and waste your breath. You know? And I don't want to either. You know? I want my time to be valued. I want to spend my time in the best way possible. And just like anything else, we need to have a plan. And we could work on how we do that plan. Now, yes, there are times where we might not do a good job, but we can work on it. Yeah, there are times that we might try it and we don't do the, you know, we look back on hindsight and say, oh, well, I should have done it a different way. But a lot of times that fear just makes us stop doing it completely. That's what Satan wants us to do. Satan wants us to have a mistake when discussing Christianity, and he wants us to throw in the towel and give up for the rest of our lives. We shouldn't do that. So this morning, we're going to look at 10 things, 10 tips on how to discuss Christianity effectively with others. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. This is such a special chapter. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Because it talks about time. And how there are different times to do certain things. So number one, we should select a proper time and place. Select a proper time and place. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 7, it says a time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak with wisdom and with experience. We will learn on when there is a time to keep silent about our faith and there is a time to speak about our faith. So number one, select a proper time and place. You know, if we are working if we are at work and we are on the clock, you know, it would be irresponsible for us to neglect our work do- duties to speak about our faith. Now think about that. Now does that mean that we should you know, go the opposite direction and, and do whatever we can to hide our faith? Absolutely not. Does that mean that there, are, that there are times that we should bring up our faith at work? Absolutely. You know, if there are, is any way, but that doesn't mean that we are to you know, not work and intentionally give up our, our duties and responsibilities to talk about Christ. Now, if there is any way that we can talk with our coworkers about Christ, absolutely, we should do it. But maybe, you know, if there's a time and place where we recognize that it's a time to keep silent, you know, let's make a time, make a place, you know, schedule a time, schedule an outing. It doesn't have to be so grandiose where, okay, let's go to the preacher's office and stay there for eight hours on a Saturday. No, it could be a simple time for lunch. You know, it could be a phone call. It could be a text message, a Facebook message, an email. We need to find the proper time and the proper place. Number two, when discussing Christianity effectively, we should seek, we should first seek to understand, then be understood. Turn your Bibles over to Proverbs chapter 18 few pages back to Proverbs chapter 18. Seek first to understand, then be understood. So let's say we're at that proper time, we're at that proper place to discuss Jesus Christ. And we might, you know, think about, okay, when we're, what are we going to say whenever we meet with that person? 
How are we going to go about it? What are my arguments going to be? What are my verses going to be? And it's going to be prepared. However, it's not going to be so rigid where the only thing we worry about is what we are going to say when we get there. We should first seek to understand, see where they're coming from, you know? see what they have to say about a matter, see where they are at on life's journey. In Proverbs chapter 18, verse 2, these scary words, it says, A fool, a fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. A fool has no delight in understanding. It's foolish to try to participate in a conversation and all you care about and all you're thinking about is what you are going to say. Even if what you are going to say is right. Even if what you are going to say is scriptural. We should first seek to understand. You know, who wants to go into a conversation with somebody and it doesn't matter what you have to say to the other person. They're not going to listen. That's not going to go very far. They're not going to want to come back and meet with you. They're not going to want to be your friend. They're not going to want to talk to you about anything else. Much less their soul. Seek first to understand. And then be understood. I love the Montgomery Biscuits. It's a minor league baseball team in Montgomery. And every time, every game, there is a man that goes, gets a box, stands on his box in front of the ticket sales and starts yelling out about God, about Christ. Now, this might be an opinion thing, but I don't think that that is, a, one, a proper time or place. You know, here I am, a Christian, as most people there are Christians, you know. But here's the thing, or at least I should say most people there do believe that Jesus is the Son of God, or they have a belief of God, you know. But is that the proper time and place? Is that individual trying to understand, or are they only trying to be understood by others. And is it effective? Well, it's not really. What is effective? Talking one-on-one, -on -one, or maybe with a trusted friend, sitting down, having that personal evangelism, trying to hear what the other person has to say, not being foolish, as 18 verse 2 says. Look over to the New Testament now in 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, we're going to sit here for a while because it just has so many good points on how to discuss Christianity effectively. So number one, select a proper time and place. Make time for it. Seek to understood, understand rather than be understood. Number three, refuse to quarrel. Refuse to quarrel. We're going to read verse 23. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. If you, get an argue, if you win the argument with somebody, you know, you're going to lose a soul. If you lose the argument, you're going to lose the soul. There's no point of getting in an argument. There's no point of getting in a quarrelsome Dispute an ignorant and foolish dispute, as it says in verse 23. Why? Because it generates strife. You know? Refuse to quarrel. It puts a bad taste in people's mouths. Think about it. If you're in their shoes... That there is somebody that every time that you try to get in a conversation with them, they get in an argument. Would you want to go back and to continue talking about that subject or any subject for that matter? And here's another thing about arguing. 
When we argue, a lot of times our emotions get the better of us. We get angry. We say things that we would normally not say. We come across a certain way that we did not intend to. It's never good to get into an ignorant dispute. Now, you can get into a very loving and you can rebuke others in a loving manner. Jesus Christ did that. But Jesus Christ never went into a foolish argument or an ignorant dispute. There might have been strife around him. Jesus never generated strife. And that leads to the fourth point. Be gentle. You know, be gentle. Now, no, you're not going to go out and convert 7 billion people in the world. You're never going to go out and, or you might not go out and say, okay, well, I'm going to sit down with this person. They're going to be living in sin, and by the end of the 30-minute discussion, they're going to be the next gospel preacher. This is people's lives we're talking about. We should be of the utmost gentleness. It goes on in verse 24. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle. Now, who? what's it, what's it say next? Be gentle to those that are in the churches of Christ? No. Be gentle to those that vote a certain way? No. Does it say to be gentle to those people that I like? Only to I like? Does it say be gentle to those people that agree with me 99% of the time and we're only talking about this 1%? No. No. It says, be gentle to all. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. We have to tread lightly. Discuss matters with love, with comfort, with peace. That is how we are gentle. And here's the thing. If somebody realizes that you love them, that you're going to be kind and understanding to them, and you're going to be gentle to them, regardless of whatever they have to say, they're going to open up. They're going to partake in that discussion. They're not going to hold anything back, regardless of what they have done. You know, People are ashamed of stuff that they have done, everybody, whether you're a Christian or not, you know. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. So when we are dealing and when we are thinking about stuff in our life that is dirty, that is nasty, maybe even downright evil, people are going to try to hide that. If you're sitting down with somebody and you want them to, and you're trying to motivate them to become a a Christian or to even get closer to Christ, a lot of times they're thinking about certain things that they have done. Now, of course, there is a time and a place. And there is maybe a time and place to address that sin. However, we should be gentle about it. And it goes on. Verse 24, and a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, able to teach. If we're going to try to go out there and teach and we're not able because we don't know the word, we're not going to be able to teach. We're not going to be successful. Now, there's a caveat to that. You might think, oh, well, I'm no preacher. Oh, well, I'm, you know, my occupation is not minister. Oh, I didn't go to a Bible college. Did you know all of us are evangelists? All of us are teachers. We are to go out and teach and spread the gospel. When does that begin? As soon as we're baptized in the water of grave of baptism. Okay, I have, in, in living with Christ... I have this good news, I have the gospel, and now I need to spread it. But frankly, church, and this is what fails many churches, 
is that they don't know how to teach because they don't know what to teach. They don't know what the Bible has to say about anything, you know? It's so sad that a lot of Christians out there, they wouldn't know the Bible if it came up and slapped them in their face. Yeah, we can go to church, and that is vitally important. Mandated by God. It's, yes, we should. But we need to do personal study as well. We need to take time and look at what the Bible has to say. And here's the thing, here's the secret. The more that we gain about the scripture, the more confidence that we are going to have to go out there and teach it. You know? Many times people ask me if I ever get nervous when I come and preach. I only get nervous under one occasion when I don't know the material that well. I get so scared. The more that I know the material, the more confident I am to preach in the pulpit. And that has everything to do with, you know, and that also applies outside of the pulpit for all of us. If we know the scripture more, then we are going to be more confident. We're going to be more able to teach. You know, we're going to be able to discuss Christianity more effectively. Number seven, we need to be humble when correcting we need to be humble when correcting look at verse 25 it says in humility we see how important it stresses love in this passage in humility correcting those who are in opposition now here's the thing today you know, liberal thinkers will think okay well you know live and let live if you correct, you don't love, so just avoid it. And we might fall into that mentality. Well, I'm just not going to correct anything. I'm not going to say anything against anything or anyone. You know, that's not what the Bible said. You know, okay, we need to correct those who are in opposition. That's what it says in verse 25. But we got to put on our thinking caps. Am I correcting those who are in opposition? Is it for, is it, one, is it, am I being humble about it? In humility, correcting those who are in opposition. You know, we have to back up. Verse 24, be gentle to all. Back up. Is it foolish and ignorant? You know, if I am going to correct somebody in opposition and it's ignorant, it's foolish, if it's going to generate strife, you know, if I'm not being gentle, if I'm not even teaching and I'm definitely not being patient, well, then that, doesn't, that means that we don't need to be correcting those who are opposition. But we should be afraid to take the pendulum to the other side. To swing all the way, say, okay, well, I'm just not going to correct those in opposition at all. That's all, not what my Bible says. If we know our stuff, and we generally love the other person that we are sitting down with, well, then we might correct but we'll do it, and we should do it with humility. Number one, select, select a proper time and place. By the way, there was one time I was driving down the highway, and I cut somebody off. I, I, I did it. I admit it. I cut somebody off. And that individual, and, and, and I didn't mean to do so, that individual drove up behind me, rolled his window down, and gave me a gesture, which was very inappropriate. And I rolled down my window. And I said, God loves you and so do I. You should have seen the look on his face. All right. I wonder what that person thought after that. I'll never know. But anyway, so just a little word of advice. Maybe do that next time that you get road rage or somebody gives you road rage. Number one, select a proper time and place. Number two, seek first, understand, then be understood. Number three, refuse to quarrel. Number four, be gentle. Number five, know your material. Number six, be patient. Number seven, be humble when correcting. Turn your Bibles over to Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1.
Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. Great wisdom. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Here's the thing. We might justify our words by saying, if they are right, then it could be a harsh word. You know. Oh, well, if it is you know, correct, then it's okay if it's a harsh word. What does that do? You know, how's that working for you? A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. We can apply that to us discussing Christianity effectively. Yeah, there's people out there, and they might call you certain names. There's people out there, and they might think that, oh, you're a stick in the mud, or you're boring, or, you know, you're just, you know, the list goes on, fill in the blank. But we should always have a soft answer. Because it's going to de-escalate the situation. A lot of times we get caught up in the harsh word. Oh, they give us a harsh word, so we give them a better harsh word, and they give us more harsh words, and then we come back, and the next thing we know, both of us have left the discussion angry. When it would have been better if we simply responded with a soft answer. There might be harsh words. There might be words that call, catch us off guard, too. We should respond softly. Number nine, we should let inquirers read it for themselves. Here's the thing, and this is probably the biggest one that we struggle with, especially in the church. You know, when we go out and we teach the Bible, when we're talking with somebody, let them argue with the Bible. The Bible will win. You know. Show them the scripture. That's the holy, perfect word of God. I am not perfect. You know. I don't always know what to say in certain situations. I might say words that later I think, oh my goodness, I should not have said that. You know. Let them look at the scripture for themselves. Did you know that Jesus Christ did that on one occasion? Here in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. There was a lawyer that was trying to mess up Jesus. He's trying to test him. He's trying to put him in a bad and tough spot. In Luke chapter 10, verse 25, it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He, Jesus Christ, said to them, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbors as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. If we go out there and we try to have all the answers, we are going to fall short. We are going to lose. But we can lead people to the one that does have all the answers. And he has spoken to us in 66 books, and they're right here. Let them dispute the Bible. The Bible will win. Let inquirers read it for themselves. If you're trying to get in a discussion and you have gone a long time, if you're trying to get in a discussion about Christ and you've been going on a long time without cracking open a Bible, you know, it shouldn't be that way. Look at what the Bible has to say. Because here's the thing. I'm trying to convert people to Christ. I'm not trying to convert people to Trent. I'm not trying to convert them to what I have to say. I'm trying to convert people to what God has to say. So a lot of times we should be, well, we should be careful because we sit down and the discussion really isn't just between me and the other person. God is there. 
And he's the one that matters. Last but certainly not least, continue the dialogue. Continue the dialogue. You know, maybe we sit down with somebody and no. You know, we sit down and talk with them for 30 minutes and they don't, they're not baptized. Or they might not believe what you have to say at that point. It might not even be, you know, in your lifetime. It might be years and years ahead that they respond to the gospel or not. You know, it's our job to plant the seed. It's up to God to water, you know. But here's the thing. We should try to continue. Set up a, another time. Keep on, you know. Don't be impatient. You know? I heard a, a really good analogy one time. Where there, let's say there's a one through ten. One is a person that's completely living in sin and debauchery. Ten is a borderline Paul. Now, no, you might not be able, in sitting down and discussing with somebody, to get them from a one to a ten. But you might help them get from a one to a two, or help them to get a one to a four. And who thinks maybe you'll help them get from a one to a two, and somebody else comes along, and they help them get from a two to a five. Or maybe you help them get from a three to a four and they do personal study and they come to the Lord and they become an eight or a nine. You know? We have to continue the dialogue. You know? We shouldn't throw up our hands and give up. Now, of course, we need to be smart about it. And if there's somebody who says, I don't want to talk about this anymore, well then, don't talk about it anymore. Now, of course, live... You could talk to them. You could preach to them by living the life of a Christian. You know, but just because we're trying to talk about Christ doesn't mean that we should neglect social cues or that we should be uh, annoying or that we should be pestering. We should try to continue the dialogue. My last verse that I would like to look at is Proverbs chapter 25. You're welcome to listen along. Proverbs chapter 25. I know we've been talking a lot about some good stuff. Discussing Christianity effectively. We are all called to spread the gospel. And we need to work at it. Just like we work at everything else. Proverbs chapter 25 verse 15. By long forbearance, a ruler is persuaded. And a gentle tongue breaks a bone. If we are gentle... If we are loving in our speech, if we know our material, and we're patient, as verse 15 says in Proverbs 25, we will become effective. We will become more effective in discussing our Christianity. Because that is how people are persuaded. Church, we need to put on Christ in baptism. If you haven't, this morning is the perfect opportunity. We need to repent of our sins. We need to reach out when we're going through tough times. We need to love each other. And we have a perfect opportunity here. And you could come forward and sit down on the pew and we can discuss Things, and maybe we could set a perfect time to talk, you know, set up a future time to continue a dialogue about anything going on in your life. But whatever it may be, if you would please come forward as we stand and sing the invitation song. <laughs> Thank you.
again, Brother Trent, for that lesson. Uh, don't forget this evening, uh, worship service at 5 o'clock. If you will, turn to number 592. We'll sing the first verse, 592. 592. And then we'll be distanced in prayer. Take the name of Jesus with you. Lord, we just pray to you. 